Well, good morning, guys. Welcome back to another week of uh, Sunday Bible study. Glad that you're uh, with us. Glad that you're able to tune in and um, get another lesson, another uh, another dive into the Word of God. Um, this week, we're going to be studying the, the church is uh, sent to encourage new believers. That's a, the title of our lesson. Um, now, the body of Christ obviously is is to encourage all believers, not just new believers. And, um, you know, all believers have a part in the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. The church universal is the body of Christ, right? And so, um, you know, not only are we there to encourage each other, uh, but we're there to be a part of the body. We're there to participate in the body of Christ, to, to, to do what God has intended for the church to do. We don't go to church. I mean, obviously we meet in a building that we call church, but we don't go to church. We are the church. And so we are participants in the body of Christ. So we should be doing the things that Christ has commanded as a church, as his body. We should be contributing to his body. And uh, as we're going to study the, the early church here, uh, the, the, the church in Antioch, um, we're going to see exactly that. Uh, we'll see believers and new believers really laying down their own lives, sacrificing for each other, um, you know, doing what is necessary. And, and, and nobody's just showing up week by week to say that they went to church. Nobody's just showing up to say, yeah, I go to church, I'm saved and stuff. Nobody's talking like that. They're talking like Christ is really their savior. They love him and they're a part of his body. And now their mission in life is to do what Christ commanded. That's, that's it. So let's get into it. I'm going to read for us. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30. I am so sorry. I just realized I forgot to put that on the screen. So that's Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30. 11, 19 through 30. I'm really sorry I forgot to put that up there. I made a mistake. I'm going to read over it, and then we will go over it again. Have your Bibles. Uh, have a pen. Uh, remember to ask questions. Pause the video and uh, discuss things with whoever you can. Um, you know, find somebody who you know is mature. If you can find someone or pray about things, and uh, just really, you know, meditate on the things that we talk about and the things that you're going to learn from the Word of God. So I'll read over that, and uh, we'll get started. Now those who were scattered, because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, that's the Greeks, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he ex exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, that means he was saved, and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. 
<clears throat> and they did so, sending it sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Sorry, I lost my spot. That was weird. A lot of really great stuff in here. Um, as always, you know, we should always be looking to study more, study deeper, to, um, to get as much as we can when we're in the Word of God, you know. Um, it's, it's not a chore. It's, it's not a task to be checked off. It's not just mindless reading that we're doing. We should always strive to, 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 to get as much as we can out of the Word of God. So when you get a chance, you know, or make a chance, dive into this more and, and cross-reference stuff. Find different subjects in our uh, section of verses, because we've got, what, 19 through 30. We've got a lot of verses. Uh, you can find several subjects in there that are really, really worth uh, some extra study time. Um... For instance, one of those things that I really stuck out to me, and I just wanted to bring this up briefly because we have we have a study to do. Um, but you know, if 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 you notice there in the middle of our text, it says a great number who believed turns to the Lord. A great number who believed turns to the Lord. Why do they say both of those things? Why bother bringing up that the ones who believed turns to the Lord? Unless it's possible that you can believe but not turn to the Lord. Interesting, right? It reminds me, this is almost the positive reverse of um, having your heart far from God. Anyways, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Today we're going to be kind of looking at, uh, you know, the, the disciples who need to be taught, disciples that needed mentors, pastors, um, followers of Christ, building each other up, helping each other stay accountable, you know, believers needing the church, and them really doing what's necessary, laying down their lives for each other, just like Christ laid his life down for the church for believers. Discipleship means you're a learner. It's one of the reasons that you come to hear the pastor preach. It's because you're a learner and you want to learn more about, about God, about his word, about uh, how to live, skill for living, wisdom. Discipleship is about going from uh, where you are to where you need to be, according to Christ and his word. You want to be moving the right direction in your faith, and that's um, growing in a greater dependence on God, so that your trust in God is deeper and stronger, that your dependence on God is deeper and stronger. That means that your dependence on yourself is dwindling. That means you have no confidence in yourself. You have all confidence in Christ. The world's going to tell you the opposite thing, that you should be self-confident and that you should be, you know, self-motivated. But we should be having our confidence in God and our motivation from God, not putting any confidence in our flesh and in who we are. That's madness. You know, left to ourselves, we're going to drift and we're going to fall but God is faithful, right? If you are saved, if he has revealed himself to you, if you are truly a child of God, you're going to be a part of the body of Christ and you're going to be with believers who are going to help you be accountable. They're going to help you understand the word of God. They're going to teach you. They're going to counsel you. Eventually, you're going to grow up and do the same for new believers, for all believers, new or not. All right, guys. We got to section one. Read over Acts 19, I'm so sorry, Acts 11, verses 19 through 21. Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 21. So, persecution. Persecution is evil. No one wants to be persecuted for following Christ. 
Yet, in Acts, we see that the Lord uses persecution as a means to spread the gospel. And in fact, if you remember Jesus' words, he said that persecution would come. It was going to happen. That we should expect it. As the first Christians scattered, they told other Jews about the wonders they witnessed. The promised Messiah had come. And believing Jews were sharing the gospel, sharing the good news with other Jews throughout the, the Roman world. And some came to Antioch to tell the Gentiles about Jesus, and the church in Antioch was born. So the persecution that began with Stephen's death led to the spread of the gospel beyond Jerusalem, just as Jesus had announced in Acts 1.8. It's encouraging, it should be encouraging to know that God doesn't waste your suffering and he uses it to advance his mission, even in persecution. If we're um, really, really praying to have, you know, the heart of, of Jesus in things, we're really begging God to do that in us, to change our heart. Um, you know, we can even rejoice that the Lord is gathering new believers and building his church. Now, that's an easy thing to agree with because it sounds right and nobody's going to say, oh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think so. But to be honest, when you're in the middle of persecution and suffering, it's hard to look that far ahead and think, yeah, that makes me happy. Um, you know, that's, that's why we always talk about prayer and dependence on God because, you know, without God doing something in you, you can't just make yourself feel that way or think that way or do that. You need, you need God to do a work in you that you cannot do yourself. And that starts with confession, repentance, prayer, 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 repentance, <laughs> and, and turning to God. You know, if, if, if you believe him, you need to turn to him. You need to turn away from the things that currently save you, that currently make you okay, and turn to Christ who can actually save you and can actually make you okay. Um, you know, it's just like on that same note of persecution and joy, uh, James 1, to, to consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kind. Um, suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. That's, that's, a, that's a promise from God Almighty. It's a solid promise from God Almighty. But it's not going to turn out that way if we don't rely on God. If we don't trust Him, if we don't believe Him. If we're not praying that way, we're still looking to something else to save us. We're still looking somewhere else. We're still essentially worshiping idols. So moving on, how has God used something bad in your life to accomplish something good? Or has that happened? So, there's a lot of trial going on with uh, the persecution of Stephen. Christians were being, you know, hunted down, essentially. But they were still proclaiming the good news about the Lord as they went on their way. They didn't use trial as an excuse. Whenever that sort of stuff comes up, you're going to have the opportunity to make an excuse They didn't use their trial as an excuse, but as an opportunity. They were looking for a way to accomplish what God had commanded them to do. They weren't looking for a reason to not have to step into what God had called them to do. There's a huge difference. As a result of their faithfulness to God, in the midst of their trial, a large number who believed turns to God turned to the Lord. Are you making excuses? Are, 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 are you making excuses for why you're not sharing Jesus with others? Are you making excuses for why you can't step into holy living for God? Are you making excuses for why you can't spend more time with God? 
be honest. Be honest. Those are things that come up in my heart. Those are things that I find true of myself often that I have to uh, really humble myself to admit that it's true of me. And I have to confess that to God and repent and uh, beg him to, you know, change, change my heart. In the face of Stephen's martyrdom and subsequent persecution, the early Christians, they must have struggled with some fear and doubt. It's easy to imagine them thinking, maybe we should just lay low for a while and maybe just not share Jesus. But then if you think about it, these are true believers. These are people that God has gotten a hold of. He has revealed himself effectually to these guys. There's no way that they're going to lay down and not share. There might be doubts in their hearts. Armed with the good news that Jesus had conquered the grave, they were emboldened to share Jesus with others. Let's read over Acts 11, 22 through 24. The good report got back to Jerusalem. Barnabas was sent to see what God was doing and to encourage the Christians in Antioch to keep serving the Lord. Luke tells us that Barnabas saw the grace of God, meaning it was obvious that God had saved these new believers, and as a result, he was glad. Because when God saves a soul, there's a change. Something inside of them changes. A lot of things outside of them change. There's, there's a difference. You can tell when someone has been with the Lord Jesus truly and is with him. <clears throat> Barnabas's joy, Barnabas's joy was increased by God's grace in someone else's life. When you're growing with God, when you're growing in dependence on him, it's just a joyful thing to see someone else come to faith in Christ. They're experiencing rest and peace in a way that we should want to see everybody experience that, have that. Believers build each other up. They do. Our words are edifying. We're encouraging to each other. We all need the body of Christ. We all need the church. But not what we can get from it. Like we're, like I was talking about at the beginning. It's not about what you can get from the church. It's not about what church can do for you. It's not about, I want to be taught this way. I want to hear the word of God come to me like that. And uh, I like the atmosphere to be a certain way. And, uh, you know, the music needs to be my brand of, you know, like contemporary, but still holy enough. And people get real specific on the things they want to see from their church. They go church shopping. There's some hilarious videos of, of church shoppers out there. But um, that's, that's not what it's about. It's the body of Christ. This is about Christ. And you can be sure that when those things are happening, People are making much of man. People are making much of themselves. They're making much of each other. But they should be making much of Christ and laying down their lives for each other. That is the purpose. That is, that is what we should be doing. That's how you make disciples. That's how you grow. That's what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. Let's read over Acts, read over Acts 11. 25 and 26. What comes to your mind when you think of discipleship? Discipleship. Being a disciple is being a learner, right? It's helping another, one another, each other, to follow Jesus with the goal of becoming more 
and more like him, right? The word of God says that we're being conformed to the image of Christ. We want to be more like Jesus. As believers, sanctification is the process of God making us more like him. We're already created in the image of God, right? So, a head start in essence there, but then our head start is taken away because we're fallen. We're unable to continue that process. We're unable to become more like Jesus. We can't do it. We're totally fallen. And so, when we're saved and the Holy Spirit of God is moved into you, you are thereby from that point to the rest of your life conformed to the image of Christ. You're sanctified. God is chipping away the things that are not like him, not of him, that are sinful and evil, and growing in you the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know those things, right? <laughs> Discipleship requires teaching. The Great Commission to teach them and observe all that I have commanded, right? It's not just about knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but to observe, live out what Jesus has commanded. And, you know, whenever you hear that, you got to remember, this isn't a call to pull up your bootstraps and get it done. This isn't a call to, uh, like, the new generation says, just do better, just be better. It's, it's always a call to confession and repentance and growing in a deeper reliance and dependence on God. We are desperately dependent and reliant on God for anything. I kind of answered this, but why do we often fail to live out the things we've learned from God's word? Can you give any examples? There should not be a disconnect between what we know and how we live. There oftentimes is, that's sin, but there should not be a disconnect between what we know and how we live. If we don't put into practice what we have learned, the gap grows wider and wider with time. It's important. It's important to act immediately when God is speaking to you. How is God's will done in heaven? Immediately, perfectly, obediently, quickly, Awesomely. That's how it's done in heaven. How is God's will done in your life? Read over Acts 11, 27 through 30. Brokenness and hardships are guaranteed in a fallen world. It's a, it's a guarantee that you will experience brokenness and hardship. A lot. Guarantee. You can't avoid it. You can't get away from it. And when you do, that's idolatry. You're trying to find a way to save yourself. You're not running to your Savior to be okay. You're not trusting God to take care of you and your future. It would have been natural for the Christians in Antioch to start thinking of their own interests. You know, I can't share. I can't give. I have to, you know, save up for my family to make it through, you know, the, the famine, these hard times that are coming. I can't, I, I can't get too involved in church because of what's coming. It'd be easy to think that in our day and age. I mean, if you look around you, and you can see where society and culture has gone, it's easy to look around and think, oh man, something bad is coming for believers. You know, if you're, if you're a Christian and you hold conservative values because you're a Christian, um, the future looks kind of grim. We're called to love our neighbors, ourselves, consider others more important than ourselves, looking not only to our own interests, but to the interests of others. And remember, we have God's promise that um, it's a pure joy when we face trials of many kinds. God draws us closer to Him through those things. Those things produce in us an endurance that we cannot manufacture, that only God can grow in us. And uh, that will lead to high character, character that is conformed to the image of Christ. A strength of character. You're going to have a dependence on God that is so strong that um, everything that it took to get there is worth it. That's the way God has designed it.
What role does faith play in our ob? Oh, let me start that over. What role does faith play in our obedience to God when we are faced with difficult circumstances? Faith has to do with trust and belief, right? Just like that, uh, what I would call that key item in our key text there, a great number who believed turned to the Lord. They believed and they turned. They believed what they heard, they considered it good, and then they turned and effectively trusted it. They trusted God. They believed Him, and then they depended on Him. If you believe God and then you don't depend on Him, you've done nothing. If you believe God and you don't rely on Him, you don't trust Him, you are not His child. That might sound rough, but is it not logical? It's the truth. Excuses. What excuses might you need to stop believing so that you can live for God more? And ultimately, this is going to fall into the area of needing to confess and repent of sin, things that you've trusted and believed to save you, things that you've run to, to take the place of God in your life. The only way you're going to be able to live for God more is to beg God to change your heart and grow you into somebody that you're not right now, to cause you to love his kingdom, to cause you to love his word so that you're in it more, get in it more, I'm not saying don't just sit back and wait until you want to. But you need to have that dependence on God, that reliance on Him. You need to shift that from yourself. Stop trusting in yourself. Put no confidence, no confidence in yourself. Excuses are the cradle that Satan rocks men off to sleep in. It's pretty heavy. <laughs> well, that's it for our study this week, guys. I think I was probably a little long, so... I hope you guys have a wonderful week. I am praying for you, and uh, I'll catch you next time.